We're back, and we're here with the author of the debut novel, The Stolen Child, Keith Donahue. Keith, welcome to Fast Forward. Thanks, Tom. And thank you for coming by. I, I have to tell you, uh, I first heard about The Stolen Child when I was reading the book world in the Washington Post, and there on the front page of the book world was this absolutely glowing review of this novel about the adventures of two changeling ch children. And when I read the book, I have to tell you, after finishing it, I couldn't believe this is the first novel you've written. <laughs> so the first thing I want to ask you before we talk about the story itself is, how did you come to write this first book? Well, it was part of a mid middle age crisis, I think. Uh, I turned 40, mm -hmm. and I'd always wanted to be a novelist. Um, but life had, had, <coughs> had intervened, as it usually does. Um, so I decided I'm just going to write what I would love to read. And I sat down uh, sometime shortly thereafter, and about eight months later, the first draft came out. I was really concerned about a couple of things, a couple of ideas um, above and beyond the, the sort of fascinating story about the changeling folklore. Uh, I, was, I wanted a story with two narrators. I thought that would be an interesting challenge. Um, I wanted one of the narrators to grow up. I wanted the other narrator to be stuck in time. Mm -hmm. And from there, it was just a matter of opening up the imagination and letting it all pour out. Well, it, it, it's really remarkable because the way it's written and from the reaction that it's received, both in terms of the reviews and publications and also some of the commentary I've seen on, on sites like Amazon and other literary blog sites that basically have talked about the book, people take away very different things from this story after they've read it. Different parts of it stand out for them. Has that surprised you? It surprised me at first, um, but as time has gone on, it's become less surprising uh, because I think readers bring their own emotional baggage, their own intellectual history, their own interests, uh, their own point of view. Some people read this as a pure fantasy novel. Other people read this as a literary novel with fantasy elements. Um, I'm happy they're reading it at all. <laughs> Let, let's, let's talk a little bit about this story. We're, sure. we're talking, our, our, one of our protagonists is a young boy named Henry Day who at the age of seven decides to run away and while hiding in the base of a tree in the forest next to his home, and we should say this is set in the early 50s, right. uh, he is taken, as it were, by a band of changelings and one of them assumes his shape and form and basically takes over his place in his family right. and grows up as the new Henry Day. While Henry, having been, and I want to talk about this a little bit, <laughs> transformed and given eventually the powers of a changeling, which are remarkable, uh, becomes Anna Day, right. but still holds on to and fights to hold on to the memories of Henry, even though he no longer has that existence. Let's talk about the changeling. What is, what, what is it about the story of, and the concept of the changeling that appealed to you? Well, I first heard about the changeling legend from the Yeats poem, The Stolen Child. Um, and, which is a lovely work it's in and of itself, and it talks about uh, <clears throat> sort of the allure of coming and joining the natural world. Come away, human child, to the waters and the wild, for the world's more full of weeping than you can understand. And they promise to, to uh, steal cherries and whisper to salmon and all sorts of wonderful things. Then the poem takes a real interesting turn in the last verse where the, Yeats says, away with us he is going, the solemn-eyed. No more he'll hear the lowing of the calves on the warm hillside. And talks about what the, that child will miss. I was really interested in that conceit of the, the sort of appeal of the natural world, but what you would have to give up. 
So that's the that's the Anade story where he is stolen and comes to sort of love and appreciate the natural world that he's in and the fact that he gets to say seven forever. But slowly that begins to dawn on him that that's not the perfect world at all. And he, he misses his family and he misses who he was and there's that real struggle for him. And, and there's also a struggle on the part of the new Henry Day yeah. who find, who basically over time rediscovers his history before he became a changeling. Right. And tries to remember that, forget his time as a changeling. And it, 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 it's about memory and it's about identity right. and it's about fitting in. And both of them struggle with that throughout the story. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. How long did it take you to decide how this little strange natural society functioned and how it worked? Uh, the three ways to leave right. and some of the other things that we won't go into detail because they should read the book. Right. Uh, how, did it, how did that come about? How did that work yeah, through? Kind of organically. I mean, it, it, I made it up as I went along. Um, I didn't start with a lot of preconceived notions about what a changeling is and what a changeling can do and so forth. Um, I was st struck by the main part of the folklore, which is this. Uh, the changelings can come and steal your child, or your, your baby usually, but, but a child, and replace it with one of their own. Um, and that, <clears throat> that actually is a, an old, old story, right? Uh, that part of it I held on to for my grounding. But the rest of it, <clears throat> as I say, came more organically. When I needed something to happen, I invented uh, a solution. Mm -hmm. um, I was concerned about the changeling sort of uh, having a parallel magic that children sometimes have. For instance, um, the changelings don't often understand what the adults are saying. They can't quite make it out. Um, they can get in and out of tight places. Uh, they change. I mean, they they like our children do. Uh, one day your son or daughter appears to have come from someplace inexplicable. Uh, those sorts of powers are really what I was concerned about. Um, the three ways of uh, that you were talking about, the three ways of getting out of the situation, you know, something unfortunate could happen to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you could remove yourself from our, the changeling society, um, or you could make a switch. You could decide to grow up. You could decide to become human and make a switch with a human. So it was basically a few kind of simple rules, if you will, and then the game was afoot. And, and we get to know these two characters. We get to know Henry, the current Henry Day, the man living as Henry Day, who had an identity as Gustav Ungerland yes. from Czechoslovakia. Well, yeah, Bohemia, right. Bohemia. Uh, and we get to know Anade and Henry. And there's one other character that I absolutely fell in love with, that I identify with, maybe because I was seeing it through Anade's eyes. Hmm. And that was Speck. Right. And she was his grounding. She was his focus. She was his lifeline to his past and eventually his hope for the future. And I just found that a very compelling element in the story. Well, and Speck was my favorite as well. Um, and one of the things that I was hoping to do with the character uh, was to make her as like the many strong women that I've known in my life as possible. Um, she, she's an interesting creature. I mean, she makes some interesting choices in the book that turn the story. Um, 
and where that comes from, I'm not sure I know. Yeah, it, both <laughs> both as the as one of the people who is is most strict about keeping the rules right. of the of the group of the changeling group, and also one of the ones that fights against some of those rules in some instances. Right. And and, and another thing that that has been talked about in your story is the way it observes the fading away of nature and the moving of the barrier between civilization and nature in our country and in our society as one of the elements as it the situation for the changelings changes and, and quite honestly degrades right. over time in terms of their ability to maintain a balance with the civilized world in nature. Was that something that you felt very strongly about? Uh, it was something that I thought about in writing the book, certainly about myth and our belief in myth and our, our belief in things unseen um, and how that has perhaps in the last 50 years of the later half of the 20th century particularly, um, we didn't really take the boogeyman that seriously. Uh, and why that's so, I think there are complex number of reasons. One of your characters, one of your characters, one of the changelings says, they don't need to be afraid of us anymore. There are other things to right. be afraid of. Right, exactly. And, and, and that's, that much is true as well. But also, I think the converse is true. I think that, um, you know, one of the things that we've lost over the past 50, 60 years is the freedom and independence that children had to just go. Just go wander. Uh, I can remember as a child uh, being encouraged to go play in the woods. Um, and part of that was, you know, if you're in the woods by yourself as a child and you hear a twig break or you, know, you hear a sudden noise, your imagination just starts spinning what this could be. This could be a bear. This could be a a changeling. This could be anything. Um, I think that lack of sort of that spontaneous imagination is tied to our sort of enchantment with the world. Uh, and one of the things I was trying to do with the book is to use a story as a way of sort of re-enchanting the reader to these kinds of possibilities. And, and, and there are some, some images in the book of the changelings when they're in the wild often follow what are the them very clear deer trails through right. the forest. And if you were a child, you could find your own path through. It may have been made by other animals or other children at one time. And now, well, you've got a sidewalk and you've got a street right. and you've got a nice little square piece of parkland that you can go pretend that is, is the wild. Right. So yes, I, yeah. I, see I mean that that certainly played into into writing the novel. That whole there's a real fascinating book out called The Last Child in the Woods, and it talks about th this very thing and how children now are sort of developing a double-edged uh, fear. You know, they see on television, they see a natural disaster, a forest fire mm -hmm. on television, and are you know, horrified at the poor animals and the poor, you know, and so forth. Um, but they're also afraid because they're not exposed. The boundaries of the edge of the yard or the public park. Uh, so it's a real interesting phenomenon that's happening that I think is changing how we believe in things, which is my big concern. Yeah. Now, You've, this book's been out for a couple of years now, hardcover, yeah. then there was a paperback release last year. You went on a book tour, your first book tour. Yes. What was that experience like? Was it like anything you might have expected? Uh, it was a lot of plane rides. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, uh, it was wonderful in that, you know, you don't, as you're writing the book, the reader is invisible. An abstract. Yes, absolutely. Um, getting the chance to go to different parts of the country and, and meet people who've read the book or want to read the book uh, is just wonderful. And then there's a lot that happens sort of over time, not in the one moment, but over time insofar as what are you going to do for your next book? What are you going to write about for your next book? How will you write your next book? Um, a lot of people have 
questions about what happens to the characters in Stolen Child uh, after the you know the last new. page, um, which I think is great. Well, you've led us to our question because we are running out of time. What about the next book? Where are right. we with the next book? When will we see you on another book tour mm -hmm. promoting the next book? Uh, probably about a year from now. Um, the book is scheduled. The book is called Angels of Destruction. Uh, it's uh, going to be published by Shea Earhart Books, which is part of Crown, uh, in March 2006. Wow. And again, to play off what we were talking about March before. March 2006? Sorry. 2009. I have my <laughs> six and nine. It's my dyslexia. Uh. Um, It played off something that the that I heard from a lot of readers about people who who came to the book and said, you know, I ordinarily wouldn't have read a book like this, mm -hmm. which I was flabbergasted. And then once they started reading it, they found themselves enjoying it and so forth. Um, but it was really a question about your willingness to enter a different world um, to step outside of the sort of safety net of highly realistic stories to more speculative kinds of work. Um, and then there were people who said, yeah, there are changelings out in the woods, you know, behind my house. And I found that equally fascinating. <laughs> and I thought, well, why do we believe in things we can't see, can't prove, and angels of destruction takes that question and goes, goes with it, flies with it. Well, I'm glad we're able to answer one question. After enjoying The Stolen Child, we have Angels of Destruction to look forward to in about a year. Right. And that is marvelous. Keith, thank you so much for stopping by. We really thank do appreciate you. it. We hope you come by again in a little while after you've finished touring the country on your next tour. And until then, thank you and thank you for The Stolen Child. Thank you, Tom. Well, that's it for this edition of Fast Forward. We hope you found something of interest. We hope you'll come see us again. Until then, this is Tom Schott saying, take care.